Hello, everybody. This is Susan Henderson from Disability Rights Education and Defense Fund. And it's good to see you all. Thank you for joining us today with an, our question and answers with Dr. Noemi Spinazzi on COVID-19 schools and vaccines. Um, we'll start with a few introductory slides and we'll let people in from the waiting room as they join us. Um, next slide. Um, if you need interpretation, the, the, on the screen are instruct, there are instructions on how to use the interpretation icon. So you can hear Spanish from Leticia. Next slide. Next slide. Um, other Zoom access tips. Um, there's closed captioning. To see the closed captions at the bottom of your screen, there's a CC closed caption button. So go ahead and click that and the captions will appear at the bottom of your screen. Our ASL interpreter today is Tammy Richards. Um, if you make sure you're in a gallery view in the upper right hand corner of your screen, you can see Tammy Richards ASL. And if you pin her video by clicking on the three dots, she'll always be um, visual, visible to you. When the slides are showing, you can use the vertical bar on the right of the slide to make the interpreter and Dr. Spinazzi's videos larger so you can see them. Next slide. Um, we're asking that you please keep your mics muted so we can hear Dr. Spinazzi. Um, keep your cameras off so it's easier for people to locate Tammy, our ASL interpreter. And during the question and answers at the end of the presentation, um, we'll unmute you if your name is called. But we did have a lot of questions submitted ahead of time that we'll be asking Dr. Spinazzi when we get to the end of her presentation. Um, that's pretty much it from me. I don't think there's anything, there's no more slides from me. I'm going to go ahead and let Doc, Dr. Spinazzi, can you see the share screen at the bottom of your site? Okay, so we'll stop sharing on this end and you can start sharing. Thank you so much for having me today. Uh, can you see me okay? Can you hear me okay? I can see you and hear you. Wonderful. Um, so I uh, get to take some time uh, to talk to you today about uh, uh, return to school and about the COVID vaccine. Um, I am a, a primary care physician at Children's Hospital Oakland. Um, I am also the medical director of the Down Syndrome Clinic uh, for Children's Hospital. And uh, I have been a part of a task force um, advising and educating around safety measures uh, with regards to school reopening. Um, and uh, I have been giving a lot of talks um, around uh, school reopening and the vaccine. Um, so I have been keeping really up to speed with the latest uh, information and research, and I hope to share some of that with you today. I will ground what I say to you today in my values, uh, which are transparency. I will not be holding information back. Uh, safety, we are talking about uh, return to school. We are talking about vaccines. And we're talking about, uh, about all of this in the context of everybody's safety, the children, the families, the school staff, anybody who's receiving a vaccine recognizing that we live in a world that, that has a history of racial disparities and injustice towards people with disabilities and uh, actively working to correct that. Recognizing that dream teamwork makes the dream work and that we collaborate together and we empower each other uh, towards a shared goal. And that we have been through a lot together uh, but that we are resilient and we as a community can recover and move forth. 
Um, and again, I just want to acknowledge that there is distrust in the medical system and that distrust in the medical system has been earned through decades and centuries of uh, medical abuse and that uh, people with disabilities, people from uh, specific racial backgrounds and socioeconomic statuses have been discriminated against for years and centuries. And they've also been disproportionately impacted by the pandemic. And so, and, and that not only has the virus disproportionately impacted these communities, but oftentimes those measures that were meant to be put in place to keep us safe have also disproportionately harmed uh, communities that were struggling financially. Um, and we have to keep all of that into account. And I have to name that because I am here as a physician, as a member of that medical community. And I'm here um, asking for your trust as I present information to you. And I want to acknowledge that for any parent of a child with uh, any sort of special needs, um, that the decisions surrounding return to in-person learning feel very much uh, like weighing things on a scale because um, we are all continuing to be appropriately worried about COVID. But at the same time, many of us have seen our uh, children struggle in the educational setting um, because of the way that remote learning um, has gone uh, for many children for children in general and for children with specialized educational needs specifically. And we've also seen unequal mental health impacts, uh, right? Uh, for our kids with a specialized educational needs, um, especially um, those children with more uh, significant developmental disabilities where it's documented that there's often fewer opportunities for socialization and friendship. Um, the lack of social interaction that is usually available to the school has been really difficult. And uh, uh, so we are very much um, here talking about safety as we are considering um, risks and we are considering um, benefits of all of our options. So I want to start by talking about uh, how the virus is transmitted so that I can talk to you about risk reduction and then I can talk to you about um, return to school and vaccines. So a high risk exposure is still considered a close person to person contact for more than 15 minutes within six feet of someone who has the virus. We have heard some differences between three feet and six feet, and I will comment on that in a, in a bit, but the CDC definition remains more than 15 minutes within six feet of someone who's infected with COVID. To get infected, infected particles must go from someone who's infected and make contact with the nose, mouth, or eyes of someone who is not infected. Those particles leave the body of someone who has the infection when they cough, they breathe, they sneeze, they laugh, they talk. So there are different modes of transmission, different ways that that kind of exchange can occur. The most common is through what are called droplets. Droplets are larger respiratory particles, um, what one might consider spittle, uh, and uh, they tend to fall uh, very close to uh, uh, where the person who's talking, coughing, sneezing is, uh, is, is placed, and uh, um, definitely within a few feet. Then there are less common ways of transmission. One is called aerosol. And so aerosols are much smaller respiratory particles and those can remain in the air. They are considered less infectious than the bigger droplets because they inherently contain less virus. Uh, but we do need to think about aerosols as well when we think about modes of transmission. And then also less common is what's called surface transmission. So someone's particles, someone's droplets, someone's um, saliva or respiratory um, particles uh, land on a surface and then someone else who's not infected comes along, touches that surface and then touches their eyes, nose and mouth. 
It's actually quite difficult to catch COVID that way. It is a much less common mode of transmission. Uh, the most, most common is droplet. So when we're talking about droplets, which would be considered respiratory transmission, the, these viral particles have to leave the body of an infected person, survive through the air, and come in contact with a healthy person. So we can think about protection layers uh, to keep those particles from ever leaving the infected perso person, decreasing how long they survive in the air, and keeping them away from someone who's not infected. So this brings me to risk reduction. And this is how we think about safe return to school. Number one message that I want you to walk away from today. We are not talking about one layer of protection. We are talking about many layers of protection, one after the other, that in combination keep us safe. Think about it like slices of Swiss cheese. All slices of Swiss cheese have holes. And so stuff can get through any one of those holes. But if you layer the slices of Swiss cheese together, then the holes kind of cover each other. And in the end, what you, you see and you end up seeing is a solid block of cheese. So we are taking a Swiss cheese model of defense when we are thinking about return to in-person learning. Some of these slices may be more difficult to apply for a child with special needs. It is my absolute core belief that children can learn and that children can. And so uh, I always believe in partnering with our doctors and with our school teams um, to think about strategies to make each of these layers successful. I will now talk about one by one these layers. Number one, really important, we have to stay home if we are sick. So some children with specialized education needs also have specialized medical needs and may have chronic symptoms. And if a symptom is chronic and unchanged, this is not what I'm talking about. I am talking about new symptoms. So any new fever, cough, sore throat, body aches, headaches, congestion or runny nose, vomiting, diarrhea, difficulty breathing. And we know that in children, the symptoms can be more vague than in adults. So if there's any new symptom, this is where we err on the side of caution and we stay home and we call our doctor for a phone or video visit or in-person visit, depending on what your doctor is doing, to discuss whether these new symptoms could be symptoms of COVID and whether our kid needs a test. If anybody in the family has symptoms, then we should also take the exact same precautions because we have to do this as a team in the community, and we need to work together to keep transmission down in schools, right? So gone are the days of just sucking it up and going to school or sucking it up and going to work if you have mild symptoms. Not because we can't get through a day, but because in order to get through reopening of schools together, we have to err on the side of caution. On the side of caution. And I should mention, if anybody has had any exposure to someone with COVID in the family, then the kid needs to stay home and a discussion needs to be had about testing before returning to school. Physically distanced, and I have not updated the slide, it's actually three feet apart now. And the reason for the change from six feet to three feet is that it's actually the same amount of protection between three feet and six feet based on many recent research studies that are really convincing. So keeping our distance can be harder when kids are younger and when children have specialized physical needs that require more hands-on assistance or developmental and behavioral needs that require more hands-on assistance. We recognize that. So we flip it to, we try to stay further apart whenever possible. 
We take breaks from being really close apart whenever possible. We maximize other layers of protection if physical distancing is in itself not particularly practical. However, there's a lot that we can do in structuring a classroom and structuring our days to maximize physical distance whenever possible. Masks are a huge layer of protection. There are different types of masks. Our students will be wearing either cloth masks or surgical masks. Cloth masks are reusable. We want to go for a mask that has at least two layers of cloth. So we don't want those super thin Under Armour type uh, uh, gator masks. We are looking for masks that have at least a couple of layers because the more layers, the more it's going to block any respiratory particle or a surgical mask, which inherently has three layers. N95s need to be fitted and they are more specialized. Some of the teachers may wear N95s, especially if it's an aide who must be in very close contact with a student who perhaps has some difficulty with controlling their um, respiratory particles. Um, they are not indicated for most children. And again, they have to be appropriately fitted. We should not be seeing valved N95s these on the right are made to protect us from smoke. They are not good for the pandemic because they do allow respiratory particles to come out through the valve. Now, I know that some children with specialized needs uh, have a difficult time with wearing a mask and children can learn. Children can learn. Won't does not mean can't. So. We need to have a mindset of working with our school team to help a child learn to tolerate the mask. It might be a protocol of desensitization. It might be a system of rewards. It might be scheduled breaks from the mask. It might be thinking creatively about the type of mask that is more comfortable. I want to recognize that we might be doing some risk reduction and so Face shields are not a substitute for a mask. My goal is for children to be wearing a mask. And until they are wearing a mask, if we can at least get them to wear some other sort of shield, that might be risk reduction. So we might be working around maximizing other layers. However, and let me say it again, face shields are not a substitute for the mask. They do provide an additional physical barrier for the face. They keep us from touching our eyes, nose, and mouth. They can block particles from reaching our face, but they are not a substitute for wearing a mask. Hand hygiene will be very important. It can be hand sanitizer. It can be washing with soap and water. It should be a part of our classroom routines. Deep cleanings, on the other hand, are not as helpful because one, they're not realistic. Two, they are difficult to implement often enough to really keep surfaces clean. Three, surface transmission is far less common than respiratory transmission with respiratory particles. And four, if we are consistently disinfecting our hands, then it is less important to deep clean surfaces. However, cleaning frequently touched surfaces like doorknobs and uh, keeping individual bins for activities whenever possible can be a very helpful strategy. We want to minimize time in crowded spaces, so we should be seeing creative solutions around the arrival and departure from school, bathroom times, lunches. Testing plays an important role in managing a pandemic. Sometimes we get tested if we have symptoms. Sometimes we get tested if we have been exposed. And then some places will choose to implement testing for monitoring purposes, where the testing will be done for no specific reason other than to see how well we're doing in the process of reopening. It is very important to do the symptom-based testing and the exposure testing. So if a doctor says, you know, based on these symptoms, I'm recommending a test, we should not hesitate 
uh, to follow up on, on, on that test and we should follow through with that. Otherwise, it's very likely that your child will be kept away from school um, for a much longer period of time. And then we want to make sure we're maximizing uh, ventilation. And so when we talk about ventilation, we're talking about exchanging the air. That can be by opening windows, opening doors, um, having some instructional time outside. And then also cleaning and disinfecting the air. And that is done with specialized filters. And both are important ways that we can decrease how many respiratory particles are existing in the air and can be and can come in contact with another person. And then I want to tell you about the vaccine, which is an additional uh, slice of protection. And before I tell you about the COVID vaccine, I want to explain real quick what a vaccine is. I know you all know, but bear with me. A vaccine is like a school lesson for the body's defense system. It is meant to teach us to recognize any vi a virus, in this case, the COVID-19 virus, before we ever come in contact with it. Sort of like how if I ask you, hey, think about Denzel Washington. You just thought about Denzel Washington. However, I doubt that many of you have met Denzel Washington in person. You've just seen him a lot on awesome movies and, and, and on TV, right? So this is the idea, is by showing the body something about the virus, without the body ever meeting the virus, we become able to recognize it and fight it off if we ever come in contact with it. And there are a lot of questions about the vaccine and all of these questions are valid. And this is why I'm here to talk to you today to hopefully answer your questions. One question is, does it work? And the answer is yes. Five vaccines have been developed in the Western world, eight total actually, including the ones from China and Russia. Three are currently available in the United States. All of them are incredibly effective at decreasing the risk of death, hospitalization, and symptomatic disease from COVID-19. That is amazing. That is amazing. The, all of the vaccine are nearly 100% effective at preventing death. That's near perfection at preventing the absolute worst possible outcome from this horrible virus. Not a rare outcome considering that over half a million people have died in a year in the United States from this horrible virus. This is a vaccine that works really well. Some of us have already been vaccinated. Some of us have not yet been vaccinated. Yet, we are still getting benefit and protection from those who have already received the vaccine because vaccination drives the community rates down. And starting next Wednesday, everybody over the age of 16 will be eligible regardless of their age or medical condition as long as they're over 16 years of age. So really soon we will all be eligible for vaccination. Now, I want to answer this one. Is the vaccine safe? And I want to answer this question for you because this is a question that I had to answer for myself too. Because I got the vaccine and in full disclosure, I got the vaccine while pregnant. And so I wasn't making a decision just for me. I was making a decision for me and the person I will love the most in this world. And so I really had to convince myself that this vaccine was safe. And one of my concerns was, wait a minute, it was developed so fast, how could it possibly be safe? It turns out that actually there are almost 30 years of research on these vaccines technologies that got us ready to get to this point. So when, we were, when the scientific community was met with the task of creating a vaccine, they were standing on the shoulders of giants and they had the technology available to create a vaccine in a prompt manner as it was needed by the moment. What didn't get any shortcuts was the regulatory process. So once the vaccine was developed, it the same amount of time that it takes to approve any other medication or vaccine was carved out to look at safety. All of the clinical trials looked at at least two months of safety data after the second vaccine. Why two months? Because it turns out that 
both short and long-term side effects appear within two months of an initial vaccine. So when we have at least two months of data, we actually have a really good idea of whether a vaccine is safe or not. Now, can we know every long-term effect that could possibly ever happen? I don't think anybody here has a crystal ball, right? And so I, we have to be honest and transparent at the promises that I made to you in the, in, in the beginning of this talk by telling you that I, I can't tell you for sure that there will not be some very rare and unusual side effect that will appear. However, However, I can tell you that for every other vaccine that we've ever that has ever been developed, these the side effects tend to appear within the first two months. And that what we do know is that the disease itself, COVID-19 itself, has well documented short and long-term effects. And so we are not thinking about this vaccine in isolation. We're thinking about this vaccine and its safety and comparing it to the risk of the disease itself. And when I'm looking at this information, then I feel comfortable saying, I feel that these vaccines are actually really, really, really safe and really, really effective. What are the side effects? Well, you will likely feel some soreness. You might have fever or body aches or chills, definitely some shoulder soreness. Those are the very common side effects. You might have heard from people who have received the vaccines that, especially after the second dose for the two dose vaccines, after the second dose, people really feel under the weather for a day or two. And it's very self-limited. It resolves on its own. I had it, it happened to me, it wasn't pleasant, and I would do it a million times over because I know that it gave me protection. And in fact, I celebrated it because it was a sign that my immune system was training. It was like my body's boot camp to recognize COVID. So those, I, they, we do call them side effects because it would be nicer if they didn't happen, but they are actually a sign that our immune system is working. There have been some reports of severe allergic reactions. I wanted to know that those are very rare. It's four in a million. And they happen within 15 to 30 minutes of the vaccine administration, which is why it is recommended that people be monitored for 15 to 30 minutes after receiving the vaccine. Can the vaccine give you COVID? No, there is no live virus in it. Um, you should talk to your doctor if you have any questions. You should talk to your doctor if you're pregnant. The vaccine is now recommended in pregnancy. There's now a lot more data on the safety of the vaccine in pregnancy. As a pregnant woman who received the vaccine, I am participating in research studies and I can tell you that the CDC is following up on me and wants to know how I'm doing. Um, if you're taking medications that suppress your immune system, you might want to talk to your doctor just to discuss how well the vaccine might work for you. If our immune system is not so strong, sometimes vaccines don't work as well. And certainly if you have a history of an allergic reaction, you might wanna make a, a plan for when you receive the vaccine in the rare case that you might have an allergic reaction. Now, vaccination is a personal choice. And I'm not here to twist anybody's arms into getting vaccinated. I am here to share with you information so you can make your own informed decisions. I do think that having a health care provider that you can trust and can answer questions can really help make an informed decision. As a health care provider myself who's on social media, I have seen a lot of um, things that are not just not true about the vaccine. And again, I hope you ask me some really hard questions uh, in the Q&A part of uh, that's coming up uh, so, that I can, uh, um, so that I can tackle some of these uh, uh, incorrect information. Can kids get the vaccine? Not yet for those under 16. However, we have really encouraging data from Pfizer, um, and I think that by the summer, the vaccine will be approved for kids uh, over 12. And then Moderna is uh, doing ongoing trials for children over six months of age. Um, and so I think that by the fall or winter, uh, we will be able um, uh, to really vaccinate our youth as well. But as adults, as we get vaccinated, we are protecting our children. The main drivers of transmission are the adults. 
Children are not as good at transmitting the virus as adults are. When we look at outbreaks, it usually started with an adult. So if the adults are getting vaccinated, we're protecting the children too. And remember, vaccination is just one slice of prevention. I'm still wearing a mask. I'm still washing my hands. I'm still keeping my distance. I'm still maximizing ventilation. A word about the variants because that's all the news are talking about right now. What are variants anyway? So viruses live for one reason and it's to make more copies of itself. They go into our body, they take over our cells, our body's machinery to make more copies of themselves. And as they're making these copies, they make typos, they make mistakes. And these are called variants. And any variant, any typo can make a virus more contagious or also less contagious, cause more serious illness or less, uh, be more responsive to a vaccine or less. The variants that we are hearing about, especially the UK variant, uh, they are more contagious. It means that it's easier to spread the virus when the virus has this UK variant. The ones from South Africa and from Brazil are also more contagious and seem to be causing more serious illness. The really encouraging news is that the vaccine continues to offer protection against these variants. This is why it's so urgent that we all become vaccinated because the virus could mutate again and no longer be responsive to the vaccine. But if we stop the transmission in its track by being vaccinated, that will never happen. Because in order for a variant to happen, the virus needs to continue to spread, okay? So what, how do variants impact what I tell you? In my opinion, they don't very much. It just, they, they tell us that we need to continue to maximize all of our layers of protection, that we have tools for fighting this virus, including the variants, and that we just can't let our guard down. We just can't let our guard down quite yet. Um, but that uh, return to in-person learning, in my opinion, is not synonymous with letting our guard down. In fact, it's something that can be done safely. So I wanna stop talking and uh, uh, see what questions I can answer. Hi, this is Susan. Thank you so much, Dr. Spinazzi. That was excellent. Um, like the best direct information I've gotten from an MD ever about this. So thank you so much. Um, one of the questions that came in that I, I don't think was covered, and I'll ask this first, is um, somebody asked if you could say a little bit about the safety in infant and toddler centers, including babies with disabilities, where masks and social distancing isn't usually workable. Absolutely. So one, Early childhood education centers have been allowed to be open for the majority of this pandemic. So we actually have a lot of good information about safety in child, early childhood education centers. And uh, um, what we do know, okay, let me take a step back. The best thing about this pandemic is that I'm a pediatrician and that kids are, are not good at transmitting the virus. Kids are typically virus transmitting machines, but when it comes to COVID, for some miraculous reason, they are not particularly good. The reasons are not actually that miraculous. They involve differences in the types of receptors that they have in their noses and they have in their lungs, the strength that they have when they cough and uh, the, their, their size. And all of these are things that contribute to the fact that children are not as good at transmitting the virus. And so that has been a huge protection in the early childhood education centers, the preschools, the daycares, because if it's a little kid that's infected, then they are just less likely to be effectively passing it around to other kids. Unlike other viruses, we know that kids are fabulous at transmitting the flu. They're fabulous at transmitting viruses like RSV. And thankfully, they're not as fabulous at transmitting COVID. When we have seen outbreaks in early childhood education centers, they have typically started with the adults. So one, Thankfully, adults have been in tears, early childhood education providers have been in tears to receive the vaccine from early on. Um, two, there's a lot that 
while a little, little kid might not tolerate a mask, an adult can surely be responsible for wearing a mask and uh, distancing and being mindful about the breaks. Uh, so yes, we want to spend time with each other, but if we're ha having lunch right next to each other in the break room after wearing our mask around the, the kids for, you know, the rest of the day, then we might be sharing the virus with each other in the break room and then passing it along um, uh, to the students. Uh, so I think that um, the same layers of precaution can be in place for the adults in the early childhood education centers and uh, um, the vaccin that vaccination of the early childhood education center providers is, is another important layer of protection. And then I also think that this is where other layers um, are extra important. So the keeping the kid home if they're sick is gonna be extra important in an early childhood education center if we cannot rely on the masking and the distancing quite as much, right? Um, so I'm not taking any chances and, and my patients know that if their kid is young and they're in a daycare and they are symptomatic, I'm ordering a test for them. Um, and uh, they might not be happy with me because uh, I know that the test is not every child's favorite activity, uh, but the goal is for the safety of the whole community, right? And so we need to err on the side of caution. We're gonna be thinking very closely about maximizing ventilation. And so the air exchange and the air cleaning, uh, we can really think about that very closely when we're thinking about a group of kids where we cannot uh, necessarily do the masking and, and other things like that. We're going to do really well with hand washing. We're going to think about how we can uh, do as many of the play activities with, you know, individual play activities, washable toys, as opposed to uh, toys that are not so easily uh, washable. And then again, all of that in uh, I think that it would be, my answer would be different if it were all theoretical, but, but we have really good data from a year of pandemic and many early childhood education centers having stayed open throughout the process and having had really low transmission. So also knowing that these precautions can be successful in the early childhood education setting. Okay, um, thanks. Another question is, how safe is it for children to return to school if their parents are not vaccinated? So we have data from many school districts that reopened before we had a vaccine, K through 12, okay? And so this was our reality before the vaccine. And uh, these were districts that reopened and partnered with uh, universities or public health departments to study the impact of reopening uh, using high quality data. And uh, uh, what was found is that uh, there was incredibly low in school transmission as long as we, they, they were observing things like masking, distancing, hand washing, and appropriate staying home when people were symptomatic, teachers and students, okay? And these were real life scenarios, you know? It wasn't like on paper. These were tens of thousands of kids that returned to school in their districts. And so accounting for the inevitable pulling down of the mask, this kid isn't wearing the mask properly, whatever's that happen in real life. And again, this was before the vaccine. So we do know that it is that, that in-person learning can be safe with the right layers of precaution, even in a pre-vaccination era. And we're now in the post-vaccination era where starting April 15th, everybody will be eligible. And so I hope that this will only increase the safety of this process. Um, we have seen exam, and, and what I wanna say about these studies is that when transmission happened, it wasn't associated with whether someone was attending school or not. It was associated whether someone had attended a wedding, a funeral, a birthday party, a play date or other type of gathering. And that speaks to our behavior when we are in certain settings like being 
large gatherings with family um, or friends um, where we do tend to take our mask down, uh, do less well with distancing, be more disinhibited, uh, right? So th that was very telling information that they looked at the school districts that reopened and they followed the students and they looked at who, you know, tested positive for COVID and then they asked, was there a difference between whether they were attending school in person or not? And the answer was nah. What mattered was whether they had recently attended um, a gathering, um, which speaks to, you know, the importance of continuing to be cautious about how we behave socially, especially as we recognize that learning is very important. And with recent data showing that uh, remote learning is inferior to in-person learning in terms of educational outcomes um, and, and deciding that in-person learning will be a societal priority. Thanks. And there's a there's a clump of questions that are mostly that are um, related to kids with DD and IDD. It says, are kids with DD developmental disabilities at a higher risk of severe complications from COVID-19? I'm and what, how is that risk compared to typically developing kids? I'm especially interested in children with epilepsy and or autism. Yes. So um, we have more, overall, the risk to children is low. Overall, the risk of serious disease to children is very, very, very low. OK, it changes as we're talking about young adults and adults. Um, but when it comes to children, school age children, the risk continues to be low. There is a there is a slight increase in risk of more serious disease uh, for children with um, chronic conditions like epilepsy um, um, and complex care needs. But again, the, 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 the increase in risk is small, and this is in the setting of overall low risk. My patients are patients with more severe uh, developmental disabilities. They are patients with Down syndrome um, who are recognized as a higher risk group. Uh, they are patients with cerebral palsy. Um, uh, they are patients with autism. And uh, um, so I have um, been able to accompany families through the journey of their children testing positive sometimes. And I have been floored with how well my patients have done throughout the years when they have tested positive for COVID after being exposed uh, through their community. Um, so is there an increased risk? Yes, it's a small increase in risk in the baseline of an overall low risk for children. Um, I hope that answers your question. Right, and there was some, the, just a follow, quick follow-up to that. One of the specific disabilities was a child with 22Q11 and was wondering if his anomalous circulatory system would make him at risk for greater complications from COVID. So 22Q deletions are associated with a number of um, congenital heart issues. And so my advice would be uh, to have a conversation with your cardiologist and with your doctor about the specifics uh, of your child's cardiovascular condition uh, to make an informed decision. Thanks. And then somebody wondered, do you think cohorts, masks, and three foot distancing will be in place in the next school year? Yes. I have been I, I I've been working on advising Oakland Unified um, specifically around reopening, and I know how hard they have been working on uh, making these things happen. Um, I think that, and let me say, we're in this together, okay? If we have a, an individualistic approach to this process, we're going to fail. We need to have a community team-based approach to this. So we all need to be helping each other, wear masks, keep our distance. Uh, not as a, you know, it's not snitching. 
It's keeping each other safe. And how do we change this culture, uh, the culture that we all share so that we can maximize each other's safety? And so do I think that these things will be in place? Yes, they are things that are supposed to be in place since last week when some schools reopened in Oakland and, uh, and the past couple of weeks when some schools have reopened in Alameda and in San Leandro and in Berkeley. Um, and then, you know, between April 19th, I believe is supposed to be the day that all of Oakland goes back to uh, in-person learning or most of Oakland goes back to in-person learning. And they actually have a portal for Oakland Unified that's a readiness portal um, to look at individual sites. Um, they have uh, made a lot of changes around ventilation. There are policies around uh, masking. Uh, there's a lot that's going in uh, uh, to make this successful because, because everybody needs, wants it to be successful and everybody needs it to be successful. And so, uh, but I do think that as parents, we need to reach out to our school and our school district and ask these questions. What is your plan around masking? What is your plan around this? What is your plan around that? Reach out to the teacher. Hey, we're going back in person. What is your plan around masking? What is your plan when someone isn't wearing a mask? What are you putting in place to help kids who are struggling with tolerating a mask wear a mask, right? Like we're all in this together and we need to be asking each other questions. Thanks. And there's a few questions that are related to masking as we're talking about it. Like, for kids who cannot, it's difficult for them to wear masks and returning to school. What are your thoughts about that? Like, how should parents approach it with their school, with their school personnel, and with other, you know, other people at the school, other parents and students? And yeah, I think that it should be again a, a, a team-based approach. Um, I think that uh, the same thing that I say around learning to tolerate masks or hear, uh, glasses, hearing aids, um, any other uh, thing that goes on the face. It's about gradual desensitization. So it might be that the mask is on for two seconds and all done, great work. And then slowly increasing the amount of time that we are tolerating the mask with frequent breaks and with the uh, educator or the parent being the person in charge of the mask um, so that, um, so that the kid knows that there is an end to the mask and that they don't have to pull it off themselves. Uh, trying different textures for the mask, trying different colors, uh, incentivizing the mask by going to pick out the super cool trolls, frozen, Paw Patrol, whatever it might be that's your kid's uh, favorite um, themed uh, mask. Um, having, you know, data gathering around it. Yesterday, they tolerated the mask for a whole of five seconds. Today, it was 30. Tomorrow, it will be two minutes. Um, but really being really consistent around it. Um, I think that if we start, some kids just may not get to tolerate the mask. Okay. And then we are going to maximize other layers of protection um, around that kid. It might be that, that the people who are working with that child um, have more um, protective equipment. Uh, it might be that um, there's a little bit more distancing um, uh, whenever possible, right? It might be that we really think about uh, maximizing ventilation and having that kid sit by an open window or something like that, right? So uh, there are some things that, that we can do around the lack of tolerance of the mask, but I also think that we have to be cautious about our attitude overall, right? If we start out with, Oh, these kids, what are we going to do with these kids who will never wear a mask? That's a bad attitude. Nah, it's uh, what are we going to do to help kids who are having a tough time get to better tolerate the mask? And then we may end up admitting defeat with a small percentage of them. Um, but I, I believe in the unlimited learning potential of children. Thanks. And there's like two more questions. Um, one is related to um, for families who have children who do have um, disabilities like Down syndrome, um, arthritis. What do you think the safety is for the vaccine for those children? We are still doing the uh, safety trials on children. 
I have no reason to believe that the vaccine will be any less safe for them as it, as it is for others. In the adult trials, they did specifically include uh, people with a number of medical conditions to speak to the safety uh, for them. Um, to me, it, I, I continue, all I've ever seen about this vaccine is that it is safe, and, and way safer than the disease itself, uh, even in kids where the risk of the disease is low. Um, but, but I can't comment on how safe something will be before the studies. That's why we're not vaccinating kids yet. If you ask me, what about an adult with Down syndrome and do I think that the vaccine is safe for them? Yes, I think that the vaccine is safe for people with Down syndrome. We're just starting to gather data about people with Down syndrome and the vaccine because uh, um, they were not prioritized uh, to receive the vaccine, unlike their caregivers. Um, as far as people with arthritis, uh, we are, again, we're going to be looking at uh, or other chronic conditions, uh, we can comment on adults and uh, so far so great um, for to answer questions about children, I am gonna need to see the data. Um, and that is kind of, you know, I told you in the beginning, I'm here to talk about transparency and about safety. I'm not gonna uh, BS you, I'm gonna tell you uh, what we know and what we know is based on data that's available. If I use my brain and I think about how these vaccines work, I have no reason to believe that someone will be at higher risk from the vaccine itself, um, but, but I also need to see the data. Thanks. And then the last couple que last questions is related to sort of uh, parent, kid, parents who have kids who um, have disabilities that might may or may not put them at higher risk of severe COVID. Um, how do they, could you have any advice on how they should make that decision? And related to that is if, if there are parents who feel that they need to, their children need to stay at home in the coming school year, in the fall of 2021, do you think there's going to be that Senate Bill 98 will, will stay in place and there'll be continued remote learning? Have you heard anything about that? Um, I have not heard anything about SB 98 for the next school year, um, so I cannot comment on that. Um, I think that it will be very dependent on where we are in terms of the pandemic, right? Um, <laughs> it seemed way easier to close the schools than to reopen them. So I feel like well, the, the overall it, it will be, um, I don't see extending something being as difficult as, uh, as convincing everybody to, to go back in person, if that makes sense as an answer. As far as how to make the decision of whether to go back in person or not, I think that one is knowing the data, right? So. We closed the schools in March of 2020 when we had no idea about how the virus spread. We had no idea about how uh, it impacted children. We had no idea about how it impacted children with special needs. I personally called up several of my patients and uh, wrote letters to pull them out of school in March of 2020 because I had no idea how this virus transmitted and I was very scared for them and their return to in-person learning. So I'm the first to say that the closures needed to happen and uh, when we didn't know anything. Now we know a lot. Now we know how to keep transmission down. We know what risk is posed by the virus and by in-person learning uh, to our children. We have uh, proven layers of safety. We have very large data sets from large school districts proving the safety of return to in-person learning. Um, we have infrastructure for testing and infrastructure for masking, and we have a vaccine. Um, so I think that at this point, we are in a place where return to in-person learning will be safe for most, if not all children. And uh, um, that the children who truly should not return to in-person learning are probably just a handful. And uh, um, that is a conversation that should be had at the individual level uh, with, uh, with someone's team. 
Um, and that it's a weighing, right? A weighing of the risks of going back versus the impacts of uh, remote learning. And uh, we know that remote learning has been a lot more problematic for some kids than for others. And um, so, so I would say draw a piece of the draw a line on a piece of paper, write the pros, write the cons, uh, write the risks, write the benefits and write them down. Um, and then know that if you're thinking about a decision, it means um, if you're thinking easy decisions to make are made fast, right? So if there's an obvious yes or no answer, you make that decision real fast. If it's a difficult answer where you could go either way, then really you can't go wrong because um, because because it's gonna be a well thought out decision. And so draw a line on a piece of paper, write the risks, write the benefits, make a decision and then feel good about the decision you made and, and, and stick with it um, without agonizing too much over it. I hope that with the information I presented to you today, I was able to provide you with uh, some of the trustworthy information around the risks um, to inform that decision. Thank you so much. We're at the end of our hour, and there is an, a couple of questions that weren't that we didn't get time to ask. Um, one of them is about you know the relative isolation that we've been in for the last year and kids going back and how to prepare them for that. And what I can say is we'll collect some resources, and when we send out um, we'll, an email to all of you, we'll and we'll get share those resources. There's actually, um, we did a presentation for early childhood educators and uh, uh, the director of the SPARC program did have a piece talking about how to prepare kids uh, to going back to in-person learning. And I can send you the recording to that presentation if you wanna share it with your group. Oh, that'd be great. Thank you so much. So thank you, Dr. Spinazzi. We wish you the best of luck with your imminent birth. Um, thank you. And um, I wanna thank Tammy and Leticia and Lisa for your interpretation and real-time captioning. If you, you make this possible for all of us. And thank you everybody for joining us today. This was excellent. Take care, everyone. See you later.